Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment, the show that's all about uncovering the secrets of personal transformation and celebrating the incredible stories of those who've dared to change their lives. I'm your guide, Robert John Hadfield, and together we'll explore the power of change. Let's get started. I am so excited about today's topic. I, the, this is a success story that I think plays so well into so many of the things that we talk about in here. And before I get into it, I want to read you this little newspaper column. And I think you'll get a kick out of this. This is from the Canton Times in Canton, Mississippi, uh, December 18th, 1903. And this little article is called Girls and Love Letters. And it's by Beatrice Fairfax. Girls, put a break on your enthusiasm when it leads you into writing impassioned epistles to the men with whom you imagine you are in love. When the right man comes, write him as many love letters as your love and discretion suggest, but don't put anything on paper that you will be ashamed to read in later years. There's nothing sweeter than a genuine, tender, girlish love letter. But don't take the glit off the gingerbread. I I had to look that up. Glit, take the, oh, sorry, not glit, guilt, G-I-L-T. Don't take the guilt off the gingerbread. Basically, guilt is, uh, it's basically like saying gold, sparkle off of the gingerbread. (laughs) So anyway, that's what that meant. But don't take the guilt off the gingerbread by wasting your letters on the wrong man. Do you know what he does with those letters? Very often, he carries them about in his pocket for weeks where they rub up against sordid and business letters. And every time he wants a certain letter, he takes the whole bunch out and your pretty loving little message gets sadly frayed and soiled. And sometimes, and this is worst of all, I am sorry to say that this careless man lets your letters lie around the house where all who are curious may read them. He does not do this because he loves your letter, but because you are not the right girl and he is not the right man. And the letter is valued accordingly. When the right man gets a letter from you, he will not carry it in his general correspondence pocket. He will have it tucked off by itself in a special pocket. And if it looks worn and soiled, it is because it has been taken out and tenderly perused many times and oft. And so don't you see, little girls, that when you scatter your letters too freely among your men friends, you are not only wasting your precious thoughts, but that most precious of all womanly attributes your dignity. <laughs> like I said, this was written by, by Beatrice Fairfax. Now, this is who I wanted to talk about today. And you've probably never heard the name Beatrice Fairfax. And anyway, this was a, Beatrice Fairfax is an alter ego. And I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. In 1872, There was a woman by the name of Marie Manning that was born, and her mother died in childbirth. And her father died when she was 18 years old. And so when she was 18, she was sent off for a time to live in England, I guess with some relatives. And that's when she started writing or realizing that she really was a good writer and she actually started working on a novel or a book at that point. She ended up coming back to the United States and getting a job working at a a newspaper in New York. I think it was called the New York World where she was making $5 a week. And somehow, and I don't know how this happened, but she got an exclusive interview with the President of the United States, Grover Cleveland. And after that happened, she 
got a raise, <laughs> she got a promotion, and she started making $30 a week after that. Well, and this is where it gets interesting. In her new position, she met a couple of other ladies that worked at the newspaper that she was working at. And she suggested that the three of them start a newspaper column that would be focused on women's issues. And they decided that they were going to call this the hen coop. And that was going to be its main purpose was to, to talk about women's issues. Now, and here's where, here's where everything really became a big deal because although you've never heard of her before, what she did and what happened here has had a resounding impact even to this day, the things that it led to. The first year that they had this, this column called the Hen Coop, apparently there were three letters that were sent in to the, the ladies writing this column. And these letters were just three people asking for some advice. And this Marie Manning, when she saw this, said, I have another idea. Why don't we make a column that is specifically for advice? We'll make an advice column. And here's the thing. Nothing like that had ever existed before. This was the first time an advice column was, was created. And they created it under the alter ego of uh, the, the, the name that we were just reading a second ago, Beatrice Fairfax. And Beatrice Fairfax was going to be, it was basically write Beatrice Fairfax and Beatrice Fairfax will answer your, your questions. Now, again, Beatrice Fairfax is just a, it's, it's an alter ego. It's a name. It's nobody. It's just a made up name that Marie Manning made up that she created for the purpose of this, uh, creating this advice column. Well, not only was it successful, it was so successful more than they would have ever even imagined. And she became known across the nation, this Beatrice Fairfax on Marie Manning behind it. Uh, but anyway, the, the, this Beatrice Fairfax column became known across the country. And as a matter of fact, as the story goes, they were getting so many letters that the post office got to the point that they actually supposedly refused to deliver all of them because they couldn't handle it. So the, these ladies who were working at the journal, the newspaper, they literally had to make regular trips to the post office to pick up all of the mail that was being sent in for this advice column. Now, I, I love this story for a whole bunch of different reasons. The, 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 but, but first of all, that advice column, the first one that had ever been, that, that had ever existed as far as we know, this led to things like Ann Landers and Dear Abby long after this. As a matter of fact, uh, this Beatrice Fairfax column went on for decades and decades, even after she stopped doing it. And think about what all of those things led to. Because see, all this stuff started out as, as newspaper columns. But then once, I, I mean, look at all the different advice shows that started popping up even on the radio and, and elsewhere since then. And it was all spurred on because of this idea that Marie Manning had to create this character, Beatrice Fairfax, that would be, that would give people advice. People could, and, and I mean, look at that, even look at around the world, ever since the radio was invented, all the different call-in shows, the advice shows for, for calling in, all the different, I mean, anyway, I don't get off on that, but the point is, this had a massive, massive impact on the culture. Now, why I love this so much is not just that. It's that it's something that we talk about in this show a lot which is this idea of 
finding opportunities, and not just finding them, but making them. And it's this idea of those who do, do, and those who don't, don't. So look at, look at her. I don't know how she got the, the interview with Grover Cleveland. But whether she got that herself or not, because that may play into this as well, if she was the one that actually landed that interview. But when, when she was working at this newspaper after that, she decided to, to come up with an idea to create a new column. Rather than just following the things that her boss and, and the newspaper asked her to do, she came up with, hey, we can do something else. I've got another idea. Let's create a whole nother thing. And then they made the hen coop. And then, and this is where it's so great. They get these letters and again, hey, let's make something happen. And each of these things had not happened before. They were opportunities. She saw opportunity and she literally created her own job at her, at her employer, at the company that employed her. She created her own position. Uh, earlier today, I got a phone call from, sorry, earlier today. This was, <laughs> when I'm doing these things early in the morning, I forget what day it is. This was yesterday. Yesterday, I got a phone call from, uh, a, an employer who had interviewed somebody that had worked here at the studio and, and they'd put my name as a reference. Now, this was such an interesting interaction. So this woman talks to me for a little bit and she says, would you recommend this person? What do you think? What do you think of her work ethic? Do you think she'd be good at this particular job? And she listed out the job and said what, what this job was. And, and I listened to it and I said, I think she'd be great with that. And we kind of had this really nice conversation. And I said, she's, she's an awesome employee and, and you, you would really like, I think you'd like having her work for you. And I think she could definitely do the job that you're talking about based on my experience with her. And then as we were closing out the phone call, she said, one last thing, is there anything else about her that you think we should know that would be useful and I said, I don't know if she's told you this or not, but she happens to be an excellent video editor. And I don't know if you have any need for that kind of thing, but she's super talented and I know she loves to do that. And it was so interesting listening to what this lady had to say as soon as I made that comment. She says, that's, that's really interesting and I'm so glad you said that. Because we are talking about how we need to start creating some of those things and utilizing more video in our marketing efforts. So I'm really glad you told me that. Now, how many things do you have talents in? Do you have abilities in? That could potentially be utilized in your current job? I've talked several times in here about how I got involved in videography. My first job in videography and media, I created the job at the company I was working in. I didn't apply for one. I didn't go get some special training. I didn't get on a, a job board or something and send in my resume looking to see if I could get a job in videography. No. I started making videos at the company that I worked for. I started showing them the things I was doing. I was terrible at it at the time, but I was just working on it to get better. And once I had actually dialed it in and I was getting good at it, they started taking the service that I was doing then, making video, and started making it part of their company. I literally created my own job doing something that I wanted to do in that company. And I look at this story from Marie Manning, who created this alter ego, Beatrice Fairfax. This was all just an idea. 
how she could add value to this organization doing something she wanted to do, something she was good at, something she was talented at, and created her own position. Now, here's the secret. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. There's nothing stopping you. If you have a job with a company right now, there's nothing stopping you from making your own position there, making yourself more valuable, finding something that you want to do and just being the person who does it and making yourself valuable in the organization so that they want that service. And what was so amazing is I started doing that in originally when I started doing media, this goes back 25 years ago when I first started doing this. But what was so great is here I'm, <laughs> I'm doing media and video and all this stuff in this company. And here's the thing. I was the only one doing it. And because nobody else in the company did it except for me, number one, I created my own position. And number two, I was better than everybody else at that skill because nobody else did it. And I wasn't very good. <laughs> but that's the beauty of things like this. If you can find a way to take a skill you have, and it doesn't even have to be obvious that it belongs in that company. For example, again, the phone call that I got yesterday. Who knows? I, I, they, they apparently didn't have somebody working on those things in their company. And there was an opportunity sitting right there. All somebody had to do was just mention it. So you'd be doing yourself a great favor. And, and also this applies to clients. This applies to, if, if you're self-employed, if, if you own a small business, if you're an entrepreneur, this applies to your clients as well. So often clients come to you and say, hey, can you help me with, here's, here's something we need done. And, and then they give you this list. Well, okay, yeah, we can certainly do that list. And you start working on it. And as you start working with clients, if you're smart about this, you start looking at all the other things that they need. And rather than just following the list and following their lead, you make suggestions. Hey, you know what? Have you ever thought about doing this? What about this? Hey, we have this other skill over in this other area. We could actually utilize this to help your company. Anyway, that's what I loved about this column so much was here's this woman who basically created her own luck. She didn't wait for an invitation. She didn't go apply for a specific job to do these particular things. She was working at a place and found something that she would love, that she could do, and literally created her own position in that company. And not just created that own her own position, but had a massive impact on Western culture that still resonates to this day. It's amazing. It's amazing. I love stories like this. So I'm going to wrap this up reading another little the, the, if after the, the little column that I just read, I'm going to read the next piece of advice that she has in this advice column. And I, I actually really liked what she had to, to write here. Again, this is from December 18th, 1903. Beatrice Fairfax. And this is called Unspoken Words of Love. How many of our best thoughts are never uttered through self-consciousness or for some equally foolish reason, we push these thoughts far down in our hearts. And sometimes when it is too late would give worlds if we had only given speech to the tender feeling that was so resolutely crushed. It is well to bear in mind that quote, Many go forth in the morning who never come back at night. If the dear ones who never come back 
leave us with loving words ringing in their ears. It means endless comfort for us in all the sad, dreary days to come. But if they go forth with no loving, God speed you to lighten their way. It means for us an almost unendurable heartache. The silent ones are not by any means the unloving ones. Very often, in the depths of their uncommunicative souls, there is a fount of affection that would astonish their friends. It is merely that they have an unconquerable dislike to showing emotion of any kind. If they would once break through this icy crust of reserve, they would find that though rusty at first, from long disuse, the heart would quickly grow accustomed to the framing of loving phrases. I think that's pretty beautiful. And although that doesn't relate to the actual topic, this is the kind of stuff that, that they were writing in, in this, um, this column, this Beatrice Fairfax column. And that right there, along with all the other things we talked about, is something worth thinking about. Opening our mouths and expressing love to people before it's too late. And tying this back to what our discussion has been this whole time, opening our mouths and expressing our desire for opportunities, growth, things we want to do, being willing to open our mouths and express this to other people rather than just keeping it to ourselves, going out of our way to express ourselves, make things happen, and tell people what we think. And make sure, again, as it says here, that those people we care about know how we feel. Thank you for joining us on another Thick and Mystic Moment. We hope today's episode has sparked your curiosity and ignited the flames of change within you. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Stay connected with the Thick and Mystic Moment on all major social media platforms. Please come and share your thoughts with us and share the podcast with your friends and anyone else seeking transformation in their life. This is Robert John Hadfield signing off. And remember, do something different today. Ooh,